Awesome. Hey, good morning, everybody. So I have a, I have an old house. Some of you uh, can probably relate. Mine was built in the 18 somethings. Actually, uh, you know, I'm, uh, for part-time work, I still do uh, real estate closings and title work and stuff. And so I researched mine. Mine's the fourth oldest structure in this town. Yeah, it is. It's almost as almost as old as Rex. It's uh, it's getting up there. Well, what that means is, uh, since we've moved in, we've been in a constant state of construction. Uh, and what, what we found is that whoever built my house had money. The people who lived in it after them had less money. And then the people who worked on that stuff had less money. And, you know, so you've, you've got some things that are done great and some other things that you're like, what in the world, you know? And so, uh, so we've, we've been, you know, remodeling and fixing and repairing and patching. And, and so uh, one thing I found during that time is that YouTube can be your friend, right? There's a lot of things I've learned to do by watching YouTube videos, but <laughs> not always. Some things, I'll, I'll look at it and go, okay, well, the contractor says it's going to cost this much, and there's got to be an easier way, right, a cheaper way, and I'll search YouTube and find all these videos, and I just had one the other day that I'm trying to figure out, and I watched this video, I'm like, cool, that's what I'm going to do, and as, like, it ends, the next video starts, and it's the same guy, and he goes, hey, my last video, I was wrong, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, <laughs> great. And, it, you know, it's me being trying to be cheap, you know. I don't want to pay what the contractor says it's going to cost. Um, but, you know, a lot of times what we want to hear versus what we need to hear are two different things. And so I've been running into that. We're going to see some of that in our, in our uh, text today. But before we get into it, if you would, I uh, would like to go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us understand it. So, Jesus, we thank you for giving us an opportunity to gather together to s- to fellowship, sing songs of praise, and, uh, and to study your word. Lord, we're thankful that uh, we're able to gather in person and online. And, uh, but Lord, we, uh, since we've last worshipped together, since we've last spoken to you, we've, we've listened to some of the wrong voices and, and um, filled our, our hearts and our minds with the wrong things. And we just pray that, Lord, you would forgive us, cleanse us of those things, and and uh, and make it uh, make your word clear to us. Open our eyes and our hearts to receive your word, that we can be transformed by it. That we can leave here knowing you better and being changed uh, by your word. We we pray for your blessing on the message and on your people. We pray this in Jesus' name, Amen. So we are, uh, we're going to be mostly in 1 Kings chapter 12, but we're going to cover a little bit of chapter 11 today. And, and chapters 11 and 12, these chapters, these are kind of the beginning of the end of Israel's heyday, so to speak. Uh, things are, are going to go downhill pretty quickly from here. And we saw last week God had told Solomon that, be, you know, because you have not kept my word, I'm going to take your kingdom... And we're going to give it to your servant. Uh, but I'll give part of your kingdom to your son. And after God tells him that, we see a couple of enemies pop up against Solomon. And, and th- this is unusual because up until this point, Solomon has enjoyed just a really blessed time as, as king, right? He's, his wealth has increased. His fame has increased. He's, it's been a time of peace. And then all of a sudden, once God's kind of hedge of protection is kind of pulled away. He has a couple enemies rise up against him. And in the verses that follow, we see, uh, you know, like I said, we've got these two enemies, and then there's a mention of another guy who is going to be central to our text for the next few chapters. So we'll take a look here. 1 Kings 11, verse 28. says, Now the man Jeroboam was a valiant warrior. And when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious... He appointed him over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. So, kind of like me, Solomon has been in constant construction mode, 
right? For his whole time as king, he built, a, he built the, the temple. He built his own house, which took twice as long as the temple, which is kind of saying something. He's built all this stuff, and he's kind of a cheapskate. So he got to where, like, he, he actually has forced labor, which is, you know, a term for slavery, right? So Israel, Israel's whole existence is based on the fact that they used to be slaves in Egypt, and then God set them free and took them into the promised land, they should never have been slaves again, and especially not in their own land. So this is something God was totally against, but he's, he's instituted forced labor. Now, for me, I have kids for that, right? That's, that's their role, and they can just deal with it until they move out. But anyway, so Jeroboam was this guy of means and resources, and, you know, he was a um, you know, talented guy, and so Solomon put him in charge of the forced labor. Now, over time, once Jeroboam is put into that position, he starts to realize, you know, my king is not who I thought he was. He's not making the decisions I agree with. I I don't agree with forced labor. Uh, And and there begins, you know, he's, he's disgruntled. And then one day, God sends a prophet to Jeroboam. 1 Kings 11, verse 29 It says, it came about at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him on the road. Now Ahijah had clothed himself with a new cloak, and both of them were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new cloak, which was on him, and tore it into twelve pieces. He said to Jeroboam, take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, And give you ten tribes. So he goes on, he specifies that, look, uh, you get ten out of the twelve tribes of Israel. And if you are faithful, you can can reign over all of Israel except for Jerusalem. That's my city that, you know, that's God's city. uh, And that's for David's lineage. So Rehoboam will will reign there over two tribes. You'll get the other ten. So you get... 80% of what I promised David, if you'll just be faithful to me. It's a pretty sweet deal. Now Solomon, of course, gets wind of this, and uh, he tries to have Jeroboam killed, so he flees to Egypt to hide out until Solomon's death. So verse 42, it says, Thus the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years, and Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of his father David. And his son, Rehoboam, reigned in his place. So Solomon, if you do the math, he didn't even reign 60, or he didn't even live to be 60 years old. And it says his son, Rehoboam, is going to take over for him. So we've got two Boams, right? These are the Boam boys. We've got Jerry and Ray. Now, they're not related. Two different guys, two different kings. We'll, we'll see what that's all about. Uh, 1 Kings 12, verse 1. It says, then Rehoboam, so this is Solomon's son, he went to Shechem, for all, all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. Now Shechem, this, this place has a rich history. This is uh, Abraham and, and Jacob had both worshipped here and built altars and stuff. Joseph is buried in this place. That's great, but it's not God's city. It's not Jerusalem. He should have been appointed king in Jerusalem. But the people gather in Shechem. This, this is kind of a hint that already the people are not behind Rehoboam. And we've talked about this a little bit over the last few weeks. Rehoboam is just a spoiled rich kid, right? His dad was the richest guy in history. I bet Rehoboam always got what he wanted for his birthday, you know? He's not used to hard work. He's not used to hearing no and people are just not really thrilled with the idea of serving this guy. And so he goes to this city because it's, it's kind of, it's geographically, it's kind of the center of the nation. And verse 2, it says, Now when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard of it, he was living in Egypt, for he was yet in Egypt where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon. They sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke hard. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. 
Now, a prophet had already told Jeroboam that, hey, when Solomon dies, you get 80% of his kingdom. But Jeroboam doesn't go and try to seize the throne or seize power. Instead, he goes to Rehoboam kind of like a union boss or a steward, right? He says, you know, as a representative of these people, if you will just, you know, quit working us so hard, lighten our tax burden, we'll serve you, right? We will recognize you as king. In verse 5, it says, Then he, Rehoboam, said to them, Depart for three days, then return to me. So the people departed. This may be the wisest thing Rehoboam ever does in his life. Right? He's confronted with this situation, and he says, I need time. I need time to think about this, to get wise counsel. Right? You know, whenever you're presented with those, you know, you have to act now or you're going to miss out on this deal of a lifetime, just miss out on that deal because it's probably a bad deal. Right? Anytime someone tries to pressure you into a, a decision on the spur of the moment, you're almost always going to make a poor decision. And so, so this is maybe the wisest thing he ever does. So uh, he seeks out some counsel. So 1 Kings 12, verse 6. It says, King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive, saying, how do you counsel me to answer these people. He, he goes to the old gray beards, right? These guys who worked with his father, who was, you know, maybe the wisest king ever. They've seen some stuff, right? He goes to them. He says, how do you counsel me? And they give him good, godly advice. Verse 7, it says, they spoke to him, saying, if you will be a servant to this people today and will serve them, and grant them their petition, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. Right? That's, that's good advice, and it's strange advice, right? He's, he's asking about leadership, and they say, if you will serve them, then they will serve you. Now, this is, this is we know this is godly advice because Jesus echoes the same thing in the New Testament. We'll take you there real quick. When his disciples were sitting around kind of bickering about who was going to be the most important in his kingdom and who would get to sit on his right and his left, he says this in Mark 10, verse 42. He says, Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not... This way among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall become your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, that's how he refers to himself, did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus says, even I put other people ahead of myself. I put... My preference aside, even when it's an inconvenient, in order to serve my people. And that's how you lead. A good leader, first and foremost, is a servant. And a good leader seeks to, to lighten someone's burden, not make it worse. In Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you tired? feel like you've been carrying around too much weight. Jesus says, come to me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. That's the thing the people went to Rehoboam about, right? If you will lighten our yoke. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's go back to 1 Kings 12, verse 7. It says, they spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to this people, Jesus fully endorses that, and will serve them and grant them their petition and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. Now, they're not saying, if you will sweet talk them, if you will tell them what they want to hear. Now, this means if you will speak the truth, right, if you will communicate that you want to improve their situation, and then you act on it, right? In other words, if you 
do what you say, these people will serve you gladly. There's a novel idea for our politicians, right? Promise something and then do it. Mind-blowing. You know, Paul gives us the same advice in the New Testament. He, when he's talking about, uh, when he talks about marriage, he says, Husbands, serve your wife. Love her as Christ loved the church. Serve your spouse. Every now and then I've been asked, it's, it's always by young guys, the young guys will ask, how do I make my wife submit? And I'm like, that's, that's not MMA, man. That's not how this works. <laughs> Biblical submission is voluntarily carrying a burden. You can't make someone volunteer. You know what you can do is love your wife so much that, that her, you know, submitting to your decisions is an easy thing because she knows you love her and you've got her best interests at heart. You know that he, he t Paul goes on, he tells fathers not to provoke their children to anger and, and to, to build them up, right? Build up your children. Speak the truth in love. That's how you lead, not by force. You lead by love and service. So this is not the advice a spoiled rich kid wants to hear, right? I don't serve people. People serve me. So 1 Kings 12, verse 8, he says, uh, but he forsook the counsel of the elders, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men who grew up with him and served him. So he said to them, what counsel do you give that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, lighten the yoke which your father put on us? So these are his buddies, right? He goes to his buddies, and the young men who grew up with him spoke to him, saying, thus you shall say to the people who spoke to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, now you make it lighter for us. But you shall speak to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. That means probably what you think it means. Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. This is classic young guy, dude bro advice, right? This is, I remember one time <laughs> sitting around with a group of people and this guy was talking about some problems he was having at home and there was another guy that kind of spoke up and he goes, I'll tell you what you do. You just, you come home and you tell her, woman, you know, make sure my dinner's on the table, whatever. It was this stupid thing and, and we're all like looking at him. I go, how many times have you been divorced? And he's like, four, why? <laughs> like, yeah, be careful who you get advice from, right? But notice, who has Rehoboam not talked to? He's not talked to God about this. He wanted someone to tell him what he already wanted to do. Right? He wants to get advice that enforces, reinforces what he, he's already decided to do. In 2 Chronicles chapter 12, God tells us what was going on with Rehoboam. And he says this in verse 14, he says, He did evil because he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. Right? He just had no interest in what God had to say about the thing. We'll go back to 1 Kings 12, verse 16. It says, When all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion do we have with David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now look after your own house, David. So Israel departed to their tents. But as for the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. So he, you know, basically they say, look, we're done supporting your whole family line. You're on your own. And what happens next is, it just reminds me of a scene from like a Monty Python movie, right? Because remember, Jeroboam used to be in charge of the forced labor, but he's been living in Egypt. Now, they called him back kind of speak on their behalf, be like their union steward. But someone else has been in charge of them in the meantime. And that guy is a guy called Adoram. So this is who uh, Solomon put in place over the forced labor. He's been kind of their boss, their supervisor, whatever you want to call it. And so Rehoboam turns to this guy, and he's like, you're going to let them talk to me like that? You go out and tell your employees 
to quit being mean to me. And <laughs> uh, let's see what happens. Verse 18. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death. Well, that went poorly. And King Rehoboam made haste to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So he's like, I am out of here. So Israel had been, has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. So the beginning of Rehoboam's reign starts with him losing 80% of his kingdom on day, day one. Uh, the people basically secede from the union, and then they make Jeroboam their king. So Rehoboam, he, he tries to kind of rally the troops. He gets his two tribes that he still has. He's got Judah and, and, and Benjamin. And he tries to get them to actually go and force the other kingdoms to recognize him as king. Right? Because that's how love works, right? You're going to go force someone to love you. And now another prophet comes to him and convinces him, hey, that's a really bad idea. You're starting a civil war, and this, this won't end well. And so that kind of fizzles out. And so they, they, ab they avoid a bloody civil war, but the nation never recovers from this. Now you have what is called the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now the northern kingdom is Israel, the southern kingdom is Judah. Over time, the northern kingdom takes on another name. It becomes known as Samaria. You've probably heard a story about like the Good Samaritan, right? This is this this northern territory basically becomes a totally different country. And they the, the nation just never recovers from it. So Rehoboam, I think we can agree, he's a disaster, right? His first act as king is he loses his most of his kingdom. And uh, so Jeroboam obviously is a better option right he's going to do better first kings 12 verse 25 it says then jeroboam built shechem in the hill country of ephraim and lived there and he went out from there and built uh, penuel jeroboam said in his heart now here's a little clue for you whenever you're reading in your bible if you see it say uh, see that passage or that phrase someone thought in their heart or said in their heart, that's usually a clue that whatever follows is not good. Right? The Bible tells us that wickedness is what our heart is filled with naturally. What our heart naturally defaults to is wickedness. But he said in his heart, now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So pretty quickly, Jeroboam starts doubting what God had told him through the prophet Ahijah, right? The prophet told him, hey, if you're faithful to me, you'll have all of this kingdom and, you know, all these blessings. But pretty quickly, he gets filled with anxiety and fear and insecurity and starts making decisions based on that. When we, we make terrible decisions when they're based on fear and insecurity. See, what he's worried about is that the people, they have to go to Jerusalem because that's where the temple is. And the more they go to Jerusalem to worship, the more they'll go, you know, this is kind of where we belong anyway. And maybe they'll just... They'll leave me and follow him. Verse 28 says, So the king consulted, and we're not told who he consulted with, but he's already kind of decided in his heart, right? The king consulted and made two golden calves. And he said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, plural, O Israel, that brought you out or brought you up from the land of Egypt. That's a big statement. It was not God's plural. It was one God that brought them up from out of Egypt. And also, when they left Egypt, this is kind of familiar. You may remember another golden calf, right? Aaron built one in Exodus 32. We don't have time to cover all that today. But he, he's built a pagan 
altar. He says, you know, you don't need to go to Jerusalem and worship God. You can worship this, you know, it's kind of like God. Verse 29, he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. So he builds these things, and he places them at opposite ends of his kingdom, so that they're centrally located. No matter where you live in the northern kingdom, one of these is closer to you than Jerusalem. They're more convenient. He's more interested in what's easy than what's right. Verse 30, now this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan, and he made houses on high places. Remember, we've talked about that in the last couple weeks. And he made priests from among all the people who were not from the sons of Levi. See, the way God had set up worship of him was that the Levites, that was their job. They were the priests, right? They were the worship leaders and the preachers or whatever. They took care of the things at the temple. And Jeroboam was like, well, you know, this way, you don't have to be a Levite. Anybody can be a priest. And that seems nice. That seems inclusive. That seems progressive, right? That seems like a great idea. But what he's done is, is he's lowered the standard, right? God had a standard. These are the people that do this. Now anybody can do this. Verse 32. Jeroboam instituted a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah. And he went up to the altar. Thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made. And he stationed in Bethel the priests and the high priests or uh, uh, of the high places which he had made. So again, now he creates a new holy day, a new holiday. Um, God only had a few holy days in the Old Testament, right? There was like Feast of Tabernacles and Passover and things, and, and they happen at specific times, and Jeroboam, Jeroboam's like, you know, the main one is in the seventh month. I'm going to put this one in the eighth month, so it's, it's not in the middle of harvest time. It's after harvest time. That's more convenient, Right? That's better. That's easier. But here's the problem. We have to assume whatever God says is perfect. Right? His plan is perfect. You can't get perfecter. Right? You can't, like in sports, when I, it drives me crazy when guys are like, I gave it 110%. That's not a real, that's not a thing. Right? You can, you can only give 100%. So when you go to the top of a mountain, you're at the very peak, the pinnacle of a mountain, is it better to take another step? You can answer that. No, right? Where do you go after you take another step past the pinnacle? You're going down, right? There's nothing better than perfect. And so he's adding to God's design. Verse 33, it says, Then he went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel, on the 15th day of the 8th month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart, and he instituted a feast for the sons of Israel and went up to the altar to burn incense. So he's just made a whole new religion. Right? Because when you start adding things to, to God, you're not giving better and more information. You're creating a different God. See, so the easy thing... And the right thing are rarely the same thing. And he's all about the easy thing at this point. Now this is, so far it doesn't seem that bad. Or, you know, at least we've seen worse things. But God tells us later, we're not done with Jeroboam. He's going to be a central character for a couple more, couple more chapters in this book. But in 1 Kings 14, verse 9, here's what God says about Jeroboam. Uh, 1 Kings 14, verse 9, it says, You also have done more evil than all who were before you, and have gone and made for yourself other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger, and have cast me behind your back, or have turned your back on me. That's big. That's a big statement, right? You have done more evil than anyone ever. You know, there's still a lot more to his life that we're going to cover, but, but what did he do that's just so evil? 
Right? He changed the place of worship. Okay? Uh, he changed the time of worship. And ultimately, he changed the object of worship. He basically created a new religion, but it's bigger than that even. Is he created the schism between the two kingdoms that, last, that they never recover from. And it lasts for over 900 years. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, this is one of my favorite texts, and you could do a whole series of messages just here, but this is about 900 and some years later from what we've just been reading about. John 4, verse 7, it says, There came a woman of Samaria, so that's the northern kingdom, right, to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. This is the woman at the well. You probably, if you're not familiar with it, you've at least heard that phrase probably. Uh, For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, Ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Now, more goes into the bad feelings between the Jews and the Samaritans. There's a period of captivity, and there's a bunch of other things that happen, but it starts with Jeroboam, right? He creates this division. And 900 years later, we see it's still an issue, and we'll read it on a little bit. We'll go to verse 19. So John 4, verse 19. It says, The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. She's talking about this very division we were talking about in 1 Kings, right? The Samaritans have these other places to worship, and the Jews down in Judah say it should happen in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, verse 21, Woman, maybe this guy gives advice like the, maybe Jesus does talk like the guy I was talking about earlier. Woman, (laughs) woman, believe me. (laughs) Now I can't unhear it. Uh, An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Right, so Jesus says, look, the, the place of worship is not the the central issue. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Right? Truth matters, even when it's inconvenient. We, we can argue about the, the location of worship, the methodology, the timing, all those things. But the truth remains the truth. No matter what. And so the truth is, the Bible tells us that there is, there is one name under heaven by which men are saved. There is only one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we live in a period of, of time, of history, where inclusion and compromise and progressiveness are valued, right? And because of that, we, we can start. We try to compromise on some things and go, well, you know, maybe there's a lot of ways to God. You know, the Quran and the Bible, they agree on a lot of things. But that, that's not the truth. Right? The truth is, is there is one way. And there is one name under heaven by which men are saved. It's inconvenient to have those type of discussions. But it's true. And so it's, it's, in, you know, it's, it's convenient to go along to get along. right? It's, it's convenient to compromise. But we can't sacrifice truth for convenience. Because God says that this is the most dreadful thing that a man can do. 
So what that means for you, like if, you've, if you know Jesus, that means <laughs> sometimes what comes naturally to you, because that's what's convenient, right? That just what comes off the hip, what's easy, that's just how I'm wired. What comes naturally to you will occasionally bump up against what Jesus clearly said. And they may not line up. And now it becomes a very inconvenient thing. Right? Because uh, someone upsets me, my natural inclination is to be hateful toward them. But Jesus says that, uh, you know, they'll know your mind by your love. When I'm upset, it's natural for me to be hostile, but Jesus says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Be a peacemaker. Not a peacekeeper, a peacemaker. You actively try to make peace. It's, it's natural for me when I think I'm right to kind of rub it in a little bit, you know. But Jesus says, you know, it's more important to me that you be humble, that you put the other person ahead of yourself, and that you're willing to, to lose the argument in order to win the relationship. See, what comes naturally to us, uh, you know, we, we excuse that stuff away all the time, right? That's, I just have a bad temper. That's just how I'm wired. Really? Because Jesus said to be peaceful. You know, be a peacemaker. See, Jesus never calls us to live natural lives of convenience. He calls us to live supernatural lives. To do what does not come naturally to us. And when we run into that situation where, Jesus, I cannot treat this person the way you've called me to treat them. I really want to hit them. That's when he goes, oh, you mean you need me? You need me to work in you and through you. It's the easy thing and the right thing. They're rarely the same thing. Now, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, uh, you've been probably pretty much getting through life how you approach things naturally, right? By your natural reactions, occasionally seeking counsel from people. And doing what seems right in your own heart. Actually, that's how most of us, if not all of us, live. But I just want to ask you, if, if, you don't, if you've not trusted Jesus for your eternal life, how's it working out for you? Is everything going great? Going smooth? I bet not. See, our natural state, our natural state is to be at war with the world with ourselves, our hearts full of wickedness, it will always choose what is worst for us. And at some point we have to choose to listen to a different voice, to listen to the voice of truth. And what Jesus said is, if you will come to me, I know you're tired, I know you're heavy laden, I can give you rest. Trust me, and I'll show you. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we thank you so much that you love us more than we can understand. Lord, we, uh, we all listen to the wrong voices sometimes. And Lord, we just pray that uh, you would draw us close to you today. Remind us of our need for you. Help us, uh, empower us through your spirit to fight against our own natural inclinations. Lord, we want to do what is pleasing to you. Lord, our flesh wars against us. Help us to regard others as more important than ourselves. Help us to put our natural inclinations aside and lead supernatural lives. Lord, we've taken shortcuts done what uh, was easy to us, taken advice that 
backed up what we already had decided to do in our own hearts, and it's blown up in our face over and over. So Lord, we just pray that uh, we would trust you more, Lord, that we would uh, that you would empower us to do what is right, even when it's inconvenient. And for those here listening online that are unsure about their relationship with you, Lord, that we just pray that uh, you would open the eyes of their hearts, that they could, they would trust you to be who you say you are. Lord, you, you promised that if we would put our trust in you for eternal life, you would give it, that you've already done all the work for it. That's amazing. That's supernatural. Lord, help us to believe. And we pray that uh, each and every one of us would encourage one another to walk closer to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And we pray you come and come quickly. And all God's people said, amen. All right. Ready? Break. <laughs>